Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to the show. Welcome back. It is Action Movie Anatomy here on a Wednesday afternoon. We've been waiting for this film for literally years of our lives. It's The Equalizer Part 2. King, King, oh God, God, God. I was trying to do the line from Training Guys. Screw it up. I'll see you guys in just one quick second. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Action Movie Anatomy. <laughs> that might have been my finest moment. That was the greatest intro this show has ever had in the history of all 166 episodes. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm sweating. I, you should be. You should be. That should have caused you to sweat because I know that I would have been sweating after that intro. Oh my gosh, today is the day. Today is the day. It's The Equalizer 2. We're in studio. We're talking about it. It's Action Movie Anatomy here on the Popcorn Talk Network, the online broadcast network dedicated to talking movies, all things movie related, and pop culture by the bucketful. I'm your host, Ben Bateman. I'm joined today by Mr. Andrew Guy. I, uh... I'm the guy that beat Dan Murrow. <laughs> We're back, man. It, it, we took a week off, and it feels, whenever we take one week off. It feels like an eternity. It feels so long. It really does feel like an eternity. It's a trip. Yeah, it's pretty bizarre, actually, that uh, we, because I guess we've gotten so used to one day a week for, like, years of our lives yeah. uh, being the same routine, uh, that a week off really does feel like, it's kind of therapeutic in some ways. It is. It really does feel, because uh, uh, I'm actually taking this Friday off of Table Read. Yeah. Um, it does feel really, really nice. It's like what people talk about, like paid vacation. Yeah, right. Because the show's still going. Fans are still interacting. Yeah. But you're just sitting at home. Yeah. But we on but, a plane. But we like pre-tape episodes to make sure that there's still content. Yeah, of course. You know, I'm proud of us for that. Uh, all right, guys, we're here. <laughs> we're talking The Equalizer Part 2. There's a lot of things to talk about, as well as my embarrassing intro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that intro. I'm going to watch it. <laughs> keep, 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 keep. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we talk action movies on this show. <laughs> Those action movies, is the chat losing it? I hope so. Uh, they, yeah, they are. They yeah. are. They're having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Ben's a moron. Um, we, we talk action movies on this show. Those action movies adhere to four basic rules. Rule number one, the hero always plays by their own rules. I would definitely say Robert McCall plays by his own rules. I don't know the last time Denzel played by anyone else's rules. Except for those the rules of a Hawaiian shirt and some <laughs> sweet sunglasses. <laughs> All you have to do is wear it with confidence. Yeah. You need to fit. He's like spot. This movie's like sponsored by Tommy Bahama. He like it is. He, yeah. What? It actually is. No, it's not. <laughs> that was, that well, was deja vu. That was nice. Yeah. Rule number two: the hero and the villain are always the smartest people, beings, things, dinosaurs, what have you, in the room. Uh, yeah. I mean, I. It, it's funny because like you're supposed to feel that Pedro Pascal is the other smartest guy in the room, but he just feels like an idiot compared to Denzel. Yeah. Yeah. He totally does. He's and, got nothing and, on King Kong. No, he doesn't. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to like fight for the fact that it makes Denzel better, but I think a better villain makes the hero even more badass yeah. at the end of the day. Way better. And uh, <clears throat> Pedro Pascal has got a really weird... He's had a really weird Hollywood career so far. Super weird, yeah. Well, And we'll, we'll get to that yeah. when we get to Star Profiles. But yeah, definitely... Um, I, I mean, you would have to say like they're supposed to fit the archetypes of the smartest people in the room, so I think it kind of works. Rule number one, uh, rule number three, the movie's driven by police, military, political, or mercenary figure. Uh, he was political and military yeah. at yeah, one yeah. time. Apparently people missed your intro for some reason, so now they're all going back to watch it. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah, it's going to be great for that's everyone. That's really wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we salute you, Army. Uh, rule number four, the movie contains a minimum of one explosion. Of course, it's an equalizer movie. There's yeah, there's got There's some booby trap somewhere. Slow-mo walking. It, uh, is there actually slow-mo walking in this movie with an explosion? Ooh, there, I don't think there, there is. might not be. Yeah, there should be. Fuqua's maturing. <laughs> <laughs> <He's>... <laughs> All right, guys. So coming up on the show today, we've got a bunch of fun stuff coming up. We've got some AMA questions that you submitted that we're going to answer. We have a segment called Who Wore It Best that you don't want to miss. This one's going to be really good. Uh, we have Over, Over Siege, Under Siege, Properly Sieged on Antoine Fuqua. And we will be debuting a brand new segment called Schmodown Corner mid-episode. Yeah, Stay yeah, tuned yeah. for that. Um, quick shout-out before we get to thesis statement, and that is going to be shout-outs to Nick Gilmore and John Goetz. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, these are two brand new, uh, I believe, a brigadier general and a general, or is it just two generals? I think it's a brigadier and maybe uh, a commodore. Yeah, I, I have the, uh, the rankings all written down Nick's, here. Nick's the 10, I'm pretty sure, because... We John Goats, yeah. John Goats is our that is our new brigadier general. Yes, John Goats and Paul Denuso. Paul, our boy, upgraded yeah. from general to brigadier. John came in hot and heavy yeah. with just a straight up brigadier general uh, patronage. And yeah, we guys, with, without further ado, <laughs> yeah. we 
Salute, Salute you. you. Now, if you're wondering what the hell we're talking about, <laughs> uh, it refers to a Patreon that we'll get to later in the show. But a big shout out to you guys because we love you. If you want to follow along with the conversation, you can find me personally at Ben Bateman Media on Twitter. Uh, you guys can find me at Andrew Guy. And you can find the oh, actual yeah. show's Twitter, the Team Action Show. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Team Action Show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have yeah we have a new Twitter handle. We decided that the uh, the nebulous AMA podcast Twitter handle that we had had for years that we sort of like rarely used and was confusing because people think it's like an ask me anything podcast twitter handle right uh we decided that you know team action has become sort of between the various fan bases a thing and we just we wanted to we are team action I yeah mean, that's what we are we are team so. action so at team action show on twitter and uh it'll be a little more pointed we'll try to be a little more interactive and um yeah that's pointed. us that was a good word as it was a good use of that word nice yeah. uh, all right guys we're gonna we're gonna get into the trailer before we queue up thesis statement The new trailer drop thing they do is so weird. Yeah, where they do the thing Post before the, and then yeah. They, yeah. It's for social no, media. No, That's what it's for. No, right, no, right, right. Go. Different life. Now you come back. Yes. I'm looking for something. Yes. You can find whatever you wish in Turkey. How about a man who kidnapped a little girl from her American mother? Would not be looking for such a man. It would be dangerous. For you. For you. <laughs> Men like him would think that. I love like he's like <laughs> making his tea. He's like making. He's like everything's all like yeah. portioned out. Like yeah. moves. <laughs> You're like, oh, he's gonna kill people with tea. <laughs> he's meticulous. He's savage. He's calculated. Every time that he touched his watch, the theater kind of like giggled. They're like, Ooh. <laughs> it's like they listened when we were like they used the phrase "noble savage" and they were like, we're just gonna make a franchise around yeah. that term. Yep. That's exactly what he is in this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's literally just like an older dude going around helping people in the beginning of the movie. He's a lift driver, for God's sakes. <laughs> he made an entire career out of playing the noble savage. Yeah. What's the matter? I gotta go to my apartment. Sit on a computer. Yeah. Yeah. Just <laughs> research for hours. I can't decide if them disclosing in the trailer that she gets murdered she makes on. the movie more boring while watching it. Well, the the whole my the whole sequel move of my old friend gets murdered and I seek revenge in action movies is like yeah. It's so it's so played out now that it's almost just like. Let's make a sequel. Uh, we'll take the character from the first movie that was tertiary that we don't want to pay a full salary. Who? We'll kill them. <laughs> oh, her, her, yeah. Whoever did this have all charge skill sets. This was done by a trained professional. Give us these Star Trek. Very good. Call 911. Mm. That was pretty sweet. Oh yeah, the harpoon. Yeah, they yeah. killed my big fan of the harpoon. Yeah. Kill. <laughs> so I'm kill each and every one of them. And the only disappointment is that I only get to do it once. Oh, yes. the craft services run out of grilled cheese. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> oh man, craft services had so uncrusted. All those books around. I figured you for some kind of teacher. I'm a high level paid government assassin. That's not in that movie. movie. No. <laughs> Yeah, they had Uncrustables and Craft Services like a couple weeks ago. What's that? Those are like the they're like the little peanut butter. Oh, you're an actor. You wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, you're not an actor. You wouldn't know what Craft Services. Oh, that's where we get food. Uh, it's a it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without the crust, but oh. they're prepackaged. Wow, it was just phenomenal. Really? Yeah, they were just bites of heaven. Did you miss your call time? Uh, I actually got fired. I gained a bunch of weight. <laughs> Uh, pretty sweet trailer. Uh, quick shout out to Jules in the booth. Bonjour, Juliette. Uh, she, I think this is the first time ever engineering our show. Yeah, I think it's gotta be. How you doing, Jules? Hey guys, thanks for having me. Of course. Of course, thank you for being here. Uh, so, let's get into the first part of the show, guys. Yeah. If you're watching or you're listening for the very first time, this is called Thesis Statement. It's your biggest, boldest thought about the film. It's the thing that, if you discussed this movie at a party, you would bring up and you would say, you know what, here's the thing about this movie. This is the number one thing. It should be the best, the greatest, the only, the first, the last, never. You know, this is my favorite movie in which Pedro Pascal plays a predictable government assassin. With... A mustache. With a mustache. <laughs> Mac, we were partners for seven years. I was like, wow, you guys just took a soundbite from another bad movie. The huh? Kaiju <laughs> Attack San Francisco. Oh, I actually watched King Arthur. Yeah. I told you that, right? Yeah. Because people have been saying that Charlie Hunnam's like good in that movie. It's a very good movie. Oh, yeah. It's not a very good movie. <laughs> and he's, he's not very He's good. fine in it, yeah. but it's not a very It's just really weird. I mean, it's, it, I'd say watch it. But yeah. um, anyway. So, 
My thesis statement, I'm going to hop in first here yeah. because I, I actually saw some rumblings of it online uh, with our fans talking, and it was the thing that I think I'd said to you when I first <clears throat> when we first talked about the movie was that this movie should have been the first movie. Yeah, right. And the Equalizer should have been the sequel. Yep. This movie seemed to care so much more about the dramatics and the storyline and actually, like, putting in the due diligence to making this a real story. Yeah, right. Whereas the first one was just like, oh, I, I know her from other movies. And he cares about her. Yeah. So now he's going to go kill everyone. Yeah, and then right. he's going to go to Russia at the very end of it and kill the main <laughs> bad guy in his home. Why not? Like, that's the perfect setup for number two. Yeah, right. Right? Like For I, sure. He stopped driving Lyft. He, his leg got bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he lost <laughs> he his license. Stopped driving And so Lyft. he just reads books in a coffee shop now. Yeah. And then he runs into, is it Chloe? Uh, Grace Moretz in the yeah, first yeah, one? Yeah, it is, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, so anyway, for me, it just, this movie just seemed like they, they did all the stuff, they pulled out all the stops you're supposed to pull out in the first one. And I think what they realized was, with the first one, they didn't do all that, and people still loved it. Yeah. And people still went and watched it, and they spent money. The problem is, is that everyone expected that out of the second one yeah. already, so yeah. no one went and watched it. Whereas if they would have done this the first time and then released Equalizer as the sequel, people would have went to the theaters the first time, watched this, and been like, damn, this is actually a pretty good movie. Fuqua seems to have found something. There's a good story here. Yeah. And then number two comes out, and it would have made twice as much money. I think this movie will make quite a bit of money. Yeah, uh, it did okay. It made like 40-something million. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it'll make enough. Um, so I'll jump in with mine. I kind of mentioned it in the trailer, <laughs> and I, I think we've talked about it on the show before, but um, Robert McCall is the greatest embodiment of the Denzel Washington Noble Savage of all time. If you think about what it is, what this character is, and like what probably drew him to take it in the first place. Right. So when I say Noble Savage, this is a term my sister used with me when I was when I was a kid, and she was explaining why people like Denzel Washington so much. And the whole idea is it's like these strong, prideful characters who are like willing to get their hands dirty, but also are like very wise and tactical. Mm -hmm. It's like they have some sense of honor. They're incredibly likable characters. Yeah, and there's like, also there's usually also something flawed about them. Yes, like something small. Yeah, yeah, right. Now Denzel is of everyone I can think of the person who has made a whole career out of playing that character. Like most of his most loved characters, literally every character that he's ever played that like holds a gun is that character. They're always yeah. smart. They're always patient. They're always like pretty learned. Uh, <laughs> They and are. Like, they are. They are all all those things. Especially like I think the book of Eli was like one of the best embodiments of like just him being that. Yeah. Right. He's yeah. like precise. He's like his reputation precedes him usually. It's just your classic action movie character. But like Denzel Washington is that guy, and Robert McCall is the best because it's like, and even in this movie more than the first one. You know, the first movie he's like reading in a late night coffee shop, and that's right. where he meets Chloe Grace Moretz. And you know, she's a she's like a prostitute, and like the situation and, calls upon him yeah. to be a noble savage. Whereas of course. he's like sympathetic to the fact that she's a prostitute. He doesn't judge her. He like sees the good in her. He's like read. You know, he like reads really. He's reading books. I love like this was like one of my favorite things. You're like, oh, he's he ordered a forty dollar book at a local bookstore and had it delivered instead of just using Amazon. Yeah, like. But it's because he saved the daughter, so that's how he has like the relationship. He's kind of keeping watch. Yeah, and, and he also owns the book already at his yeah, own house. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Nice <laughs> twist at the end. Nice little uh, Easter egg. I also love that. I also love that they have the sequence, and and a lot of this I'm laughing about, but I really like. I yeah. like that there's a sequence of him driving with just listening to people. Same as they like go through their lives, because like again, and and once again, it plays into my thesis because. That's so much of who this character is. He's interested in people. He likes to just observe life. He finds it interesting. He's not somebody mm -hmm. who seeks out uh, violence, but he resorts to violence when he feels he needs to equalize a situation. Yeah, and you know, that moment of him driving Lyft, we saw it in the trailers, we all knew it was going to come in the movie, but it was still executed really well. Yeah, I was I, actually really impressed with the casting and the writing and the acting of that part. Yeah, there's I'll, so much of that throughout this movie. Yeah, there's a lot of them, like, uh, first tour, yeah, I'll be wait, I'll be here to pick you up when you get back. Yeah, like, cool some of those, moment. Some of those moments were really well done, and I actually think it's the thing about this movie that I enjoyed the most, and I was watching a lot of the junket interviews with Denzel for this movie. Um, I didn't get to do one. Our, our, our boy John Stephen Rook of The Outlaw did one, actually. He sat down with Denzel for this. Oh, right. And I watched it, and he actually asked some really good questions. He asked a question <clears throat> about the book um, that he's reading and what it symbolizes and everything. But I was thinking, like, I would love to sit down with Denzel and just say to him, like, your, your career uh, has basically 
been connected by the works of two major directors, Tony Scott and Antoine Fuqua. Yeah. Do you feel a sense of transcendence in the characters you play between the 10 or 11 movies you've done with those guys now? Because like... I would he, love to hear his answer to that question. How could he not see the similarity between those two oh, he has bodies to. of work? He has to. And, he has we, to in the same, and he plays the same protagonist. He does. And, and like... Uh, it's interesting too because they both go for the same thing less in the first movie but specifically in this movie like his relationship to the elderly man who's trying to find his sister and the, w the way that he takes his time with him he listens to him he really goes for those moments and then of course like my favorite moment of the whole movie which we'll talk about in a little bit um, <clears throat> he Fuqua really really wanted to let this movie breathe a little more so yeah. that's why it's a little longer it is he, a little too long in my opinion but yeah not, not too too long but he tries to build it out and make yeah. it a little more interesting mm -hmm. and, and you see this often with sequels action sequels especially you know uh, John Wick 2 is very similar in that sense where like we need to build more of this assassin's world and we need to expand on his relationships and, and right. we need to see more like you know it can't just be the action of course the action has to ratchet up but like um, That's it's an interesting uh, correlation you just made there. Yeah, in those two films. Well, they just what they do is right. They 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 literally look and they say, okay, how are we gonna, how are we gonna make more money with the second movie? Because we're gonna have to pay him more money. Mm -hmm. And then on top of how we're gonna make more money, how are we gonna make it different than the first movie while still keeping the identity? And so the Taken Two is the same way. The sequels of these movies are like, well, it's an action movie. You have to give us heightened action, so it has to be bigger. And every action movie follows its own specific formula. Right. You know, like this movie is the same as the first one. It's like you see him be a badass here. He sees the people that needs help. He learns more about it. He a few more moments of badassery, and then he takes him to the Home Alone scenario in the end of the movie. Yeah, right. Uh, which I think is great. Yeah. So, uh, guys, thank you so much for that part. Tuna, uh, throw in your thesis statements in the chat. I think I saw a couple in here that were really good. There was one that <clears throat> someone mentioned about like Fuqua finding the balance finally between action and drama with this yeah. film and Denzel and you and I talked about this a little bit last night and I don't remember who made the point but I do remember it being very poignant in that it was that uh, Denzel the reason that Tony Scott succeeded so much more and and it's not to say that he did it so much more but that's more of like a, a personal opinion just because yeah, right. we like Tony Scott movies more um, is that Tony Scott succeeded at making Denzel the everyman right he made him approachable, he made him relatable, whereas Fuqua, it seems like he, he more and more tries to make him a badass. Yeah. The reason that Tony Scott succeeds, or I guess in that scenario wins, is because Denzel's already a badass. Yeah, right. In every situation. That guy could be ordering dinner in real life, and you could be sitting next to him, and it would still sound like the coolest order you've ever heard. So yeah. if you make him sound like the everyman, or if you make him more relatable, like you're like, I could be that guy, I understand yeah, right. that guy, and he's already a badass. I think that's why those moments in Man on Fire and in Deja Vu right. and in The Taking, they just hit so hard for us. They just hit home. Is there a four, a fifth um, Denzel Fuqua collab I'm forgetting? Magnificent Seven, Equalizer One, Equalizer Two, Training Day. Did they work together again somewhere in the 2000s that I'm forgetting? I don't think so. I think that's all of them. Shooter, Tears of the Sun, King Arthur, Brooklyn's Finest. Uh, two Guns. Two Guns. <laughs> That's Balthasar Kormakor. I hate that movie. <laughs> uh, all right, so, so, but yeah, I, I agree with you, and I think the everyman versus sort of the badass is like, that's clearly what they were going for differently, and I, I would say, we'll get to this a little more when we talk about overly sieged, underly sieged, properly sieged uh, Antoine Fuqua, but mm -hmm. I still prefer the qualities that Scott pulled out of Denzel in his movies. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because the moments that he pulls that are like really authentic, they don't feel sandwiched in the same way. Like, even, as much as I liked all the stuff in this movie that he did well, it still feels sandwiched between very formulaic action. Yeah. Whereas, like, Tony Scott, like, we've said before, like, the first hour of Deja Vu is, like, really interesting. That, that It's, like, a really interesting action movie. It's well done. It's well shot. It's beautiful. It's, uh, you know, Man on Fire has, like, great, great dramatic relationships. Like, yeah. that movie makes me cry at the end. Yeah. You know, like, there's, there is, uh, the, there's a depth... But then again, and, and again, we'll talk about it in Fist Pump Moment in just a second, which is probably a good transition here to the next portion of the show, yeah. which is Fist Pump Moment. So guys, if you're watching this, you're listening to this for the very first time, Fist Pump Moment is that moment where something happens in a movie. You're looking around, you're like, are you seeing this right now? Are you seeing this? Yeah. Oh, I get to watch the rest of this movie. This is so good. Uh, There's like a hush or an energy that comes over the theater or the yeah. crowd. Like you guys can all feel that moment. Yeah. Yeah. There exactly. you go. Exactly. Yeah. And we it's, both have pretty sweet ones. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think Fist Pump Moment, like... Uh, sometimes it's like an actual fist pump, which yeah. I do sometimes. Sometimes it's the moment in the theater when everybody's like, oh, 
Like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Um, and guys, I will tell you, I <laughs> yeah. saw Mission Impossible Fallout and I posted a tweet about it. We're doing it on the show next week. Talk about fist bump moments. Oh, my God. I'm so mad that you didn't have a plus one for that and that you've just seen it. It's just been days that you've seen it now. I've just seen the movie. <clears throat> yeah. It's, I'm so excited to talk about it next week. And I'm just sitting at home watching a Star is Born trailer. I mean, Mission Impossible Fallout trailer. Low key, I've watched it five or six times since you told me. A Star is Born? I had seen the trailer once. But I've now seen it a few times. I've, I watched it like thirty times yeah. at the gym the other day. Yeah, when he's when he's he's like, hey, he's like, what? He's like, I just want to get another look I'm at take you. Another look at you. The the, the music in the trailer is great. Yeah, it's really good. Um, all right, beautiful. so so <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> Andrew's crying. Uh, all right, so fist pump moment, guys. This is that moment in the movie, and for me, my ultimate fist pump moment in this movie was the entire sequence. This picture on the screen here is exciting, <laughs> yeah. but we're not there yet. Yeah, I'm um, excited. <laughs> it's it's the sequence where he he grabs Miles and he takes him out of like the the drug den, and he's pissed because he's just lost his only friend, but he like. He's like, before I go take care of business, I gotta go get this kid out of danger. Yeah, because he's I can't like checking his him. watch. He walks in, and you're like, is he just gonna kill all these dudes again? You're like, and, and you're, like you're unsure what's gonna happen. He gets him. He's like, let's go, Miles. And he's got like, the guns crossed. Yeah. And then he takes him downstairs, and Miles is like, what you doing, man? And he's like, and Denzel like gets real with him. You even know who these people are? Yeah. And I love that Fuqua. This is like the moment where Fuqua's like, all right, so here's the deal, dude. He's like, I I've seen your work. I know what you've done. And this is the five minutes of the movie where we're going to get peak Denzel. Look, we man, I've seen Training Day. Yeah. <laughs> I directed Training Day. I don't know if you know that about me. <laughs> uh, but he's like, I need some combination of, like, Training Day Denzel, Malcolm X Denzel. I need, like, all that. Now, just, like, yell a lot, say some inspirational shit, maybe, like, throw in a couple of, uh, you know, you don't, something about death, maybe. Yeah, something uh, about death, something about being a man, something <laughs> like, just, like, do whatever you got to do, and it'll be great. And Denzel's like, I got you. Yeah, and he's like, spit a lot. Spit yeah. a lot and get really close to him. And he's like, and, and Fuqua's like, this was in your contract that we got five, contractually we get five minutes of this. So this is where we're, we're burning it all in this one scene. And he like, literally, Denzel's just like, oh dude, there were so many good, and I'm laughing about this, but this is my favorite movie oh, of the whole movie, it, it by was, far. Yeah, because I was sitting there kind of laughing and like, oh. Yeah, exactly. You know? like, I was like, yeah. I was inspired. And he grabs him and he's like, he puts the gun in his mouth. He's like, what you got, killer? What you got, son? And, uh, <laughs> you don't like, know what death looks like. Like, Man is not spelled G-U-N. Like he's, oh dude, he has so many good lines. He and then, says that? Man is not he spelled. He says man is not spelled G-U-N? Yes. Man, I must have been so in the zone. Oh dude, and he has a couple lines about like, <laughs> it all happened so fast that I, I was like, maybe I should illegally record this, but I was like, nah, that's, that's a bad idea. But I was like, I'm trying to find it this morning, like anything, oh, yeah. the script, whatever I could yep. find. Couldn't find it. Um, those of you watching or listening, like know what we're talking about. It's so like inspirational. There's even a line that he throws in about something about like, uh, this isn't about like the white man not giving you a oh, chance. There's so much social commentary in that like two yeah, minutes. So much, and like it's just great. And and uh, Gotta pull yourself up out. Yeah, he's yeah. like he's like you, you know you a killer you you know you and, and then he like as he walks away he's like but Mr. McCall why me he's like why not you I was like oh yeah oh I want to run for public office. But doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't he say but why me again? Yeah, he does. Yeah, but why me? I don't know what he yeah, says. I can't remember what he says. And either. the whole time we're just sitting there, just like, like, what about the people upstairs? All with guns who like would immediately come after yeah. you. Denzel doesn't care. He I just, love it. They're just up there, just like, they're. Yeah, do you hear them yelling down there? He sounds furious. <laughs> he sounds furious. <laughs> was that his dad? Was that his dad or his uncle? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to go down there and kill him, but I'm kind of scared. <laughs> oh, so yeah, good. It was a very, very good. That moment. scene was my favorite in the movie. Yeah. Uh, for me, I mean, God, yours just kind of blew it out of the water because it was such a great moment. Mine is very subtle, and it's the moment when Denzel goes into kill mode. Yeah. It's when he's get, he gets the phone call. And what I love is, like, because, you know, as an actor, you know, every phone call in a movie is fake. Right. There's no one on the other line. Yeah. So Denzel is, like, slowly having this reveal, right? And you yeah. see it You see it when he, like, he stopped because he's like, oh, hey, how's it going? He's man? like, hey, he's like, hey, Bill Pullman, what's oh. up? Oh. And then his face gets real serious. Yeah. And then he like gets up and walks and he leaves his book. That's how you know it's serious. He serious. leaves his book. He doesn't even say anything to Miles. And yeah. He just keeps walking. He's like, yo, Mr. McCall, you book. And he yeah. just keeps walking. And then he goes in his, well, he, I mean, <laughs> he goes to DC really quickly, but then he goes back to his apartment and just hacks. And yeah. he's like knocking on the door, like leaves the book. He's just hacking away, like researching. Yeah. And for some reason, I just love that he went into kill mode. 
And then he went into his apartment and just like, right. hold up. Hold up. I loved it. Yeah, he's not answering the door. He's not doing anything. But it was also just the fact that, like, that was, it's like a super badass look. Oh, yeah. Like, that's a very, ta- like, it's a great talent to have as an actor. Oh, dude, he's, and he's made a whole career off of it. Into he's, going into kill mode. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, it's amazing. This movie has a lot of fist bump moments. I mean, there's some really great lines. There's, like, I mean, his kills are sweet. Yeah, the, the when he does go into the, the, the crack house or whatever, and yeah. he, like, the elevator dude, I yeah. think it is, and he he like opens, he kicks him, and he like smacks his head yeah. against the wall really quick. I'm like, ah, yeah. God, that would hurt so bad. One of my favorites too is because uh, you know throughout the movie, like he's killing different people, yeah. but a yes, lot of them, is. a lot of them are like trained killers or they're like badasses. Right. I love when he goes up to the like like lawyers den or whatever, like they, just whatever who these mm, guys are. Mm-hmm. They're all like pieces of crap. They've just like raped this girl, yeah. and he's just like, I'm, none of you are gonna get out of here. But like I'm sitting there just being like. These guys are just like, like they're just like doing drugs and have money. Like these, they don't even stand a fucking chance. No, like they're, like, they're, they're, yeah. like you're gonna kill all of them. You could like use your left hand, and you'd kill them all. I love when he he like, uh, cause he doesn't kill any of them. I think he no, cause, cause he doesn't. He snaps the one guy's neck. Yeah, so you watch him snap his neck, and he does it just enough, cause yeah. the guy's eyes are still open. He's like, oh, he like breaks his neck, but doesn't kill him. Oh, interesting. Which I thought was super awesome, cause I like, I don't know if all those people should have died. I don't know exactly what happened to that girl, but yeah, what I right. do know. Is that he knew that they needed to take a severe amount of pain they and punishment? They needed to pay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, severe amount. Was super sweet. He like broke that one guy's arm like six times. Yeah. <laughs> he like horrible. he like wrecked those dudes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and they deserve and they deserve to be wrecked. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, all right, we are going to continue moving through the show, guys. This is Star Profiles. It is the next portion of the show where we talk about an actor's career, where they were in the making of this film. Denzel versus Pedro Pascal. We'll start with Pedro. So, a lot of people know Pedro Pascal. So, we'll pull up the image of a Denzel character profile here. Are you doing Pedro first? Pedro first. Pedro, sorry about that. Um, and, <laughs> you know, Pedro is, is known for a couple shows. He, yeah. I think, became most famous for Narcos. Yeah, but definitely. But prior to Narcos, he was known as um, a character whose name I'm forgetting right now in Game of Thrones. He was a very, very well-liked oh, well, character. Yeah. In Game of Thrones, who I'm just, somebody in the chat's going to tell me because I'm forgetting. He's like a super sweet swordsman. Um... Swordsman. Yeah, he's great. Uh, and then, obviously, Narcos was a big deal. And then he just shows up in a lot of other stuff. He's like, he's been yeah. in a bunch of stuff now. Um, he was in Kingsman, The Golden Circle, uh, Prospect, The Great Wall. Um, which I tried to watch yesterday. Yeah. Can't find it. The Great Wall? It must have been that bad that no one out there is like, well, just put it up online for people to legally stream. It made some money. It was really hard for me to find. I couldn't find it. <laughs> Matt Damon uh, with yeah. the ponytail? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other day, I was walking by, and someone's like, yeah, that guy, he's like the cheap, he's like the poor man... Poor man's Matt Damon. I, yeah. I was completely just walked by. I go, you Jesse Plemons? They're like, oh my God, yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> so I felt really bad for Jesse Plemons in that moment. Um, yeah, so Pedro pops up in The Great Wall, Kingsman, The Golden Circle, and Prospect. And I really like him in Narcos. Yeah. But I do feel like his buddy, uh, Boyd Holbrook, oh, yeah. has gotten such a better career after Narcos. And I think he's found, uh, really what it is, I think he's found his own as an actor, whereas Pedro just feels like he's an actor being placed into roles. Yeah. And he doesn't really own them. Uh, even in the in the Golden Circle when he played uh, whiskey or tequila or whatever he was, like a whiskey? I think it was whiskey. Maybe whiskey. Channing yeah. Tatum's tequila. Yeah. I think. Um, he was just kind of whatever, and he's also a bad guy in that one too, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, he totally, he's like, uh, he's, he's been cast into these, into these like, I'm slightly not trustworthy. Prince kind Ober- of a good guy. Oberyn. Yeah, Prince Oberyn. That's what it is. Um, so, who, by the way, has a spoiler alert for you? A he savage dies. death. Yeah, yeah. Everybody dies in that show. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Literally. That's why. Yeah, I, I, I do know that about the show. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that's Pedro, and you know, he. I mean, he, he's he must be. I'm guessing Pedro Pascal is probably like 44. So yeah, he looks like he's mid 40s, right around there. So well, for I mean, him, yeah, he's having a good career. Yeah, he's having a great career. He could still, and he. I think he's a good enough actor. I never watched Narcos, but I heard he's really. Goodness. He's great in Narcos. Yeah. Um, now, on the flip side, we have Denzel Washington. His last three films, Roman J. Israel Esquire, Never Fences, saw it. Magnificent Seven. I saw all three of these movies. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I did. I watched uh, Roman J., well, 80% of it on an airplane recently. How was it? Uh, it's like he was nominated for Best Actor for it. Well, because it's like, I was one thing I was going to say when we were watching the trailer for this is yeah. that, like, it's because, because, like, uh, Denzel hasn't done, like, I mean, Fences. Obviously, is like yeah. a very strong powerhouse performance, but like a character. Well, Roman J is. I mean, yeah, that's well, the that's fun. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. There's last two, and he was nominated for best actor <clears throat> both. Like he's kind of a little bit on the upswing in that regard again. Yeah, Roman J is pretty forgettable. It's it's uh it's fine. I think that there's a 
there's an issue that we run into with with iconic actors and actresses after a certain age where you've seen them do something for so long no matter how good they are it's super super hard to see anything other than that's Denzel Washington playing a quirky lawyer yeah exactly and like that's what I struggled with that movie was like he's doing a good job I just think that another actor playing this role would probably be more convincing because like right now this feels like Denzel trying to play a weird character for sure I understand that um, and you know Fences is a super slow movie like Fences is I like I think did you me, like it or no no it was too slow for you. <laughs> He's great. Uh, there's moments in Fences that I really like. It's, She's great, from what I gather. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just, I just, it's not a movie that I ever would want to watch again. I turned it off 20 minutes in the first time. I, it took me like a couple different times to get through the whole movie. Right. Right. Um, but I mean, he's obviously one of the all-time great actors. So like, seeing him do stuff like that, if you're in that right state of mind, is great. Have you watched Lincoln yet? No. Are you going to? Uh, I know. I hate that movie so eventually. much. Eventually, I'm like so mad. It'll at be it. part of a specific Schmodown training regimen at some point. I'm just angry at that movie for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For uh, stupid movie games. <laughs> I like this is like so exciting. I'm not gonna say anything about it, but like my training regiment for playing against John Stephen Roca in the Schmodown is so good. Yeah. I'm not admitting to anything of what it is, but I'm just so proud of it. I mean, I think that's a pretty good segue. Yeah. Sounds that sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. Uh, so we are gonna get into the next bit of our show, guys. The first thing we're gonna do is tell you guys about our Facebook groups. Yes. Uh, we have two of them. There's one for Action Movie Anatomy, this show. Uh, it was started by wonderful fans of our show, and it is uh, moderated by those fans. It's about 1,500 people who uh, watch and listen to the show. You guys can go find that on Facebook. Also, there's a fan page for the Action Army that is fast approaching 1,000 members. Yes. It's for our characters on the Schmodown. Uh, and uh, we have a, a couple couple thank yous. We already shouted out our Brigadier Generals, Paul Denuso and John Goetz. You guys will be getting shout outs every show from here to eternity. Yeah. As long as you're in the ranks of uh, a Brigadier uh, General. I mean, Francis X. Humble. Good Lord. Yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> uh, but also, we wanted to throw out a, a giant thank you in the same segment to uh, Tobias Mustad, who's another brand new general, yeah. which is really exciting for us that we have this many people at the high, lo high level of the Patreon uh, that are excited. Yeah. And uh, did we shout out Brienne last week? We, we did. We, but Dude, we'll shout her out yeah, again. Yeah, we'll shout her out again. Brienne uh, Chandler, a good friend of ours, has also made her way to the general ranking. Our first female general in the and, action army. And while we're at it, let's throw it out to Andrew Hayes as well. Yeah, just because Andrew, our boy. That's like literally everybody at the general and above level, and we want to thank all you guys because you have made a giant, <clears throat> giant impact on what is the Patreon. Again, stay tuned after uh, our next segment. We'll talk a little bit more about what the Patreon is. But coming up right now, we have a brand new segment. It's called Schmodown, Schmodown Corner. Corner. Yep. Yeah. All right, Jules, we can, we can cut the segue. Oh, the ball's dropping. Way to go, <laughs> Jason Inman. Guys, I don't know if you see what I see here, but it's a gigantic... Tr it's gigantic. Let's make sure we like, like lower that so that the frame like, can fully capture it. Like that. Yeah, there you I go. I go all the way back up. You're just going to do some curls with your trophy? Yeah, just do that. <laughs> and then what it says on the bottom, it says, Andrew Guy, a.k.a. Goat Killer, Movie Trivia Schmodown 2018 mm. Moment of the Year. Guys, this was made by Nick Gilmore in the Action Army who we actually shouted out at the top of the show, but we had to give a little more love. Uh, I got a trophy. I mean, this is, this is a ridiculously gigantic trophy. I don't know what I'm going to do with if it. If you guys are I wondering, did Andrew repurpose his uh, soccer trophy when he was 12 and make this up? He didn't. This arrived in a this this arrived in an offensively large box it today. It was so <laughs> large. The box is over there. It's taking up the entire couch. I had no idea. He had sent me a picture, and it was small. Yeah. In the picture, it looked very small. I so thought it was going to be like this big. I th I th this is probably like the size of box that like Denzel's sponsor Tommy Bahama gear shows up to set in. <laughs> yeah, like, there's only one shirt in it. Yeah, in front of the <laughs> this TV here? The main TV. One in, uh, where the desk oh, is. Oh, oh, down oh, here. down. That's a okay. good idea. That's big, guys. Great. There we go. All right, hold on. Let's see what we can do. I yeah. got it. Okay, yeah. Okay, so while Andrew exactly. presents this enormous trophy... Uh, yeah, it's exciting. Uh, one more time, just a giant thank you to Nick Gilmore. Uh, but uh, all right, Schmodown Corner. Let's let's talk about what's going on here, guys. This brand new segment. Some of you who listen or watch the show are also fans of Collider's Movie of Trivia Schmodown, where Andrew and I compete as Team Action. Uh, some really really big stuff going on. So some 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 things coming up. First of all, Sorry. I am going to be playing John Stephen Roca, and at the same time that's going to be happening, there was another announcement, and that is that Andrew Guy is going to be playing against Mark 
Yodi Riley. Yes. Holy. Ben and I have literally taken leaps and bounds in the Schmodown over the last few months. And we're playing two former championship ch champions one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, there's only a few champions the league's ever seen, and we're getting to one-on-one -on -one play them. Uh, also, they're two members of the Horsemen. Yep. Drew just beat Merle. I mean, there's a lot of really exciting stuff here. So so Drew playing Riley, me playing Roka. That's huge stuff. Uh, again, we'll, when we get to the Patreon stuff, we can talk a little more about that because there'll be a more built-out conversation there. And another huge thing coming up is this massive KO Anarchy tournament where you and I are going to be split up. Corruption. Yeah, we're going to have a... So we're not going to get to play on the same I mean, unless team. we somehow get put on the same team, but I don't think they would ever allow that well, to happen. Well, it's randomly drawn, so I suppose like it could be... <laughs> that does sound pretty team action. Yeah, it'd be pretty sweet, actually. <laughs> if, we, if we find out when they draw the names that we're on the same team and everybody else is, that'd be so sweet. Team action just like facing off against like, the entire league. Yeah, be yeah. amazing. So that's a thing. There's the corruption tournament. That's uh, That'll be, from what I understand... The tournament and the winner of that tournament, I, th I think we'll play at Spectacular because I think the, probably the way it matches up, I don't think we start shooting any of that stuff till the fall. No. Um, and then, yeah, I think it'll be in the Spectacular and then whoever wins that will be, I think be I th up for the champions. No, I think the Spectacular, there's usually a title <clears throat> match, team title match at the Spectacular. Yeah, yeah well, that's what I mean. Whoever, so they'll whoever, be the whoever, champion. Yeah, goes through the whole anarchy tournament will be the champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and then currently going on right now, we also have the Inner Geekdom Tournament. Um, so I watched uh, the, the the Mara Emma match. Yep. Um, I also watched some of the Donica Kalinowski match. Um, so on on the IG front, you know Mara is definitely a rising star. She's exciting. She's really good. Yeah, Donica is a huge, huge. I'm a huge Donica fan. Uh, he had a rough game. That does happen. Um, hopefully he'll be able to bounce back. Did you see his post about it? I did. Yeah, and I, I did see his post. It's, it's a giant shout out to Donica because. Uh, you know, Mark's a longtime friend of ours, and it's also somebody who has been a part of this network. He was the the yeah, he was the engineer of the show for a year. Yeah. Um, and uh, he had uh, he, he went online and he openly talked about the fact that he had a panic attack that day uh, and just sort of didn't realize that that was something that he was going through. And it's a huge amount of respect that I have for Mark to come out and talk about that publicly. Yeah, absolutely, man, because you and I both know, look... Uh, there's always anxiety the day of the match. Always. Whether it's overbearing or not, whether you can keep it in line or not is, is another fact uh, of the matter. But it's a tough day. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of lights and there's a lot of people. So props to Donica for going out there and, and fighting. You know, Brianne's talked about this before, too, is you go out there and you fight and people rip you apart when you have a bad day. Yep. Uh, which just fuels the fire. So <clears throat> shout out to you guys. Always love seeing you guys compete. We love everyone in the Action Army. Thank you so much for your support. And that is going to do it for our new segment, the Schmodown Corner. Yeah, Schmodown Corner. Wrapped up. All right, Ooh, off come the sunglasses. Jeez, I was like, it's so dark in here. Yeah, it's I crazy. can't read my outline. <laughs> uh, all right, so the last thing we want to talk about here before we get back to the uh, the regularly scheduled programming is that we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash teamaction. It is for additional content that Andrew and I make Outside of here, we sit in front of a giant Nicolas Cage banner. We talk about all things movies, movie news, action army, Schmodown related. Uh, and for a minimum of a dollar a month, you guys get that additional content. We actually just hit a milestone last week. It, we, we catapulted past it. Yeah, we had a goal, and we hit that goal, so now you guys are going to be getting two videos a week what exclusively <laughs> uh, <laughs> exclusively to the Army, so check that out, patreon.com slash teamaction. There will be a full video coming out, uh, like probably 20 minutes behind the scenes talking about our matchup predictions coming up with the uh, the Roka and Riley matches that we expect to see, and uh, you know, kind of our, our preparation for it. We'll be talking about that behind closed doors, so get excited for that. Let's get back to the show. All right, so we're going to hop into production development next, guys. We're going to try to <clears throat> somewhat breeze through this because you're pretty familiar with the players. Richard Wenk, who also wrote the first Equalizer film, he's known for writing Expendables 2, Jack Reacher 2, Magnificent 7, and his original uh, <clears throat> excuse me, script that put him on the map was 16 Blocks, star or, yeah, 16 Blocks starring Bruce Willis and Most Deaf, I believe? Uh, that sounds right. Yeah. Sounds right, right? 16 Blocks, that would have been like, what, like 2004 probably? 2006. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, other, the only other thing, interesting thing about Richard Wank is that he actually didn't start his career till he was 50. So guys, never give up. Never yeah, surrender. I always I remember when we've talked about him in the past. That's really really that's cool. A cool thing. Yeah, he's in now with sort of the uh, the new age action crew. <clears throat> yeah, um, I mean all those movies are. I mean Jack Reacher two actually turned on last night as I was going to sleep. We enjoyed Mag Seven. Equalizer has been good. So uh, I'm gonna let you take it away on your boy Antoine Fuqua because yeah. I know you love him. Well, Fuqua, I think you know the, the thing to really mention here about him just just to be quick is that he started out as a music video director. So there's a there's a pr uh, prevalent hip hop theme in a lot of his movies. Mm -hmm. um, you know he's a guy that had worked in music videos in 
that uh, part of the music business for a long time. Did training? To, say, so? Sorry, did Tony Scott do anything in music videos ever? Or was yes. he, he did, right? I believe he did. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. commercials and music videos. Yeah, yeah. Um, at least commercials, maybe not music videos. Yeah. But uh, Training Day was obviously the breakout film from uh, Antoine Foucault, which he will never be shy to tell you in his trailers. And uh, f throughout the years, he did a lot of different stuff, everything from Tears of the Sun to Shooter, King Arthur. Um, he did two Equalizer movies, Southpaw. He, Magnificent Seven most recently. Definitely a guy who works well with, with Denzel Washington and definitely a guy who <clears throat> exists somewhere at the intersection of action and drama uh, and a strong presence, I think, of sort of like black culture in his movies. That's like yeah. a very, you know, he's one of he's one of the actually biggest, probably highest grossing black directors we have right now. Oh, definitely. Right? I think I mean him and Coogler and F. Uh, Gary Gray and F. Like, Gary Gray have got to be the three heavier hitters, I would think. Yeah, Spike Lee's movies don't really make money anymore. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, he's obviously having a, a pretty amazing career. We've talked about him at length, so. I think, you know, rather than doing producers, because it's just Fuqua, Denzel, and a few others, yeah. we're going to do a segment that we like to do called Overly Sieged, Underly Sieged, Properly Sieged. Uh, and <clears> this <throat> is a segment where we talk about somebody, are they overrated, underrated, or properly rated, with Antoine Fuqua, which is funny because I've complained about him so much on this For show. Years. For years. Literally years. But we've literally <laughs> come full circle. We have. There's no... Is there something on me? No, why? <laughs> I don't know. I'm I looking, at, looking at me. Are you just <laughs> looking at my trophy? <laughs> Looking uh, at the Star is Born trailer. <laughs> Andrew's crying again. I am crying. <laughs> I think you're beautiful. Uh, so for me, I'm going to hop in first because I have a much... Uh, my opinion of Fuqua was never as strong as yours. Much less tumultuous yes, relationship exactly. with Volatile. Volatile. Um God, I, I, I think I can only say he's... I think I can say he's properly sieged. I think for me that feels appropriate because... Yeah. Look, you still get to make movies. Right. You still get to make movies with Denzel Washington. Now, are any of them going to be Academy Award winning movies? I don't know. When Southpaw came out, that's what everyone seemed to think. Yeah. But it didn't, and it wasn't. And, it, and for me, it actually kind of fell flat. I actually really liked Magnificent Seven. Yeah. I was kind of shocked at how good it was. It's like a lot more violent than we expected. Yeah. And, and like... Um, Pratt's really good. Pratt has a dark turn. Yeah, it's cool. So... I think he's properly sieged, and the reason I say that is because I don't think you can be under sieged and be making the movies that he gets to make with the amount of freedom that he has with yeah. the people that he that he gets to make them with. And I don't think he's overrated because it's not like you're out there talking about him every year winning Best Director, Best Picture, like yeah. this next Fuqua film. Now, for the five years, or honestly, even the decade following Training Day, that's yeah. what it was. It was yeah. the director of Training Day brings you this movie that's going to blow the shit out of your brain and you're going to win an Oscar. And it was like, never happened again. It never happened again. I, I'm going to jump in and say that he's overly sieged. Okay, um, perfect. So, And I thought about this a lot because like, ends. I pretty much, you know, and I, maybe I'm shooting myself <clears> in the foot because Fuqua, I've talked about him so much, he's somebody I'd love to talk to. I'd love to sit down and interview him. I mean, oh, I'd and be, you, you love him now. Yeah, I do. I really, really do. do. But I think culturally he is overly sieged. And the reason I say so <clears> is I still think there's a stigma attached to Antoine Fuqua's movies that on any given year he could make something that's like, a contender, like of an course. awards contender. Just like Southpaw. Yeah, and I think that that notion is not backed up by anything. It's only backed up by the fact that, that Training Day at the time that it came out was like a pretty big movie. And I, I like Training Day, but I don't think it's very good. I think it's I don't think it's bad. I just yeah. don't think it's very good. <clears throat> it's aged interest interestingly. And that's like the crown jewel. I, I enjoy Southpaw. A big shout to Richard Eric Jarvie because I know he's a big fan of that yeah, movie. Yeah, we do know Richard um, loves it. I love Southpaw. Like I, I really enjoyed watching that movie. I thought Jake Gyllenhaal was great in it. Um I actually like Forrest Whitaker in that movie a lot. I'm not making that up, right? He's in that movie. Yeah, he's in yeah, he's the trainer. Yeah. Um so I <laughs> I, I really enjoy those movies, but on the whole, like, the movies he makes are shooter. They're, like, movies like that. So it's, you know, even the Equalizer franchise, these are great, but it's, like, but anybody other than, like, li like literally put Michael Jai White instead of Denzel Washington, and these movies aren't good enough for they're, Netflix. Exactly. And and the first Equalizer was only successful because of, like, the interesting story, Denzel being a badass, and, like, fun action, which I know that partially has to do with the director, but almost any director could do that. Yeah, I mean, I guess the difference is that Safe House sucks, and, like, so bad and like it has denzel and, and it wasn't and ryan reynolds and it wasn't successful so like maybe that's a great reminder who that directed like, that uh it's directed by ed word eduardo Zwick. no <laughs> it's directed by like a it's directed by like a spanish director who i'm forgetting it's okay like no, it something. doesn't matter um, <clears throat> damn, I need to know that. I know, uh, someone will write in the chat someone will write in the chat yeah. so uh all right and anyway that's that, that's what i say i think that he I think that he is still perceived in a way that he is like uh, in the cream of the crop. And it's because of the box office receipts of his movies. That's the reason. Yeah. It's because his movies make money. And I think he le the world leans into that more 
than they need to. And that's why I think when I say overrated, I don't think he's overrated for what he is because I love his movies at this point. I you just, just think, think the fact that every time he makes a movie, if it's even somewhat legitimate, people are like, this could win an Oscar. It could be that great of a movie. Or, yeah, or yeah. Or it's an Antoine Fuqua film, so you know it's going to be of this caliber. Exactly. Like it's like you like people have some some notion that it's going to be of quality. Where like, I think that they're good movies and they're entertaining movies. Yeah. But the most relevant thing about them is that they're entertaining. I mean, go back and watch Training Day. I challenge you guys to do that. For the most part, I, I think I like that movie more than most people. I know I like it more than Ben, but it has aged poorly. Uh, speaking of aging poorly. Yep. Let's talk about some of these these uh, who wore it vests because oh this is exciting. Can we talk about where this inspiration came yes, from? Yes, yes, yeah. please. So when when Ben and I were watching the trailer for this movie, and as you guys saw, there is an, a very interesting outfit that Denzel wears in the beginning of the film. It's like he's got uh, he's got like a beard and uh, glasses and glasses and this like white. Uh, it's like a skull cap of some kind. Yeah, I mean, we, we for lack of a better term, I'll say it. I'll, it's kind of like a turban type thing, but we don't know exactly what it is. If he's supposed to be Egyptian or from Istanbul, or we're yeah. not sure. Like, I'm not going to speak on it, but what I do know is that it is peculiarly similar to an outfit worn by none Wesley other Snipes than Wesley Snipes in the trailer for The Art of War, which we've talked about this one shot Ooh, at length. Wow. Now, there's a great moment in this trailer where Donald Sutherland says to him, I don't believe we've met. And Wesley Snipes is like, we still have. We still haven't, sir. Because he, he shakes his hand. Because he's like undercover. Because he is. So uh, let's hop back to Denzel really quick, Jules. Who wore it best? Oh, nope. that's Michelle Ooh. Pfeiffer. Ooh, which, which we got coming up next. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say just right off the bat, I go Snipes. I do too. <laughs> I 100% <laughs> do too. Snipes rocks it. Yeah. So, so, yeah, Denzel looks good, but he, he, it's like, that's Denzel Washington. It also is <laughs> relatively clear to me that they shot that scene last because, like, I think that was probably a reshoot because he's bald yeah, at this he's, point. Yeah, he's his head shaved and yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the, why, like, unless it's just supposed to be a different time. So yeah. that's probably, like, they either shoot this at the beginning or at the end. But I think probably a reshoot makes a lot more sense. Yeah, and then we'll hop over to Snipes. Yeah, I think, I think that the Snipes picture... Uh, truthfully, I've still never watched Art of War. First of all, it's fantastic. Yeah. Maybe. Second of all, Michael Bean in it is fantastic. Michael Bean's in Art of War. He's the bad guy. Oh. Yeah. Ooh, oops. Spoiler <laughs> alert. It's a twist. Uh, yeah. Wesley Snipes just owns it there. I think it's really the top. The yeah. top really. They went the extra mile with costume design there. Uh, so, so that was a fun one. We're gonna hop into a little bit more serious of one, guys uh, in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, they love it. They yeah. love it. Uh, we're going to hop into a Catwoman one because this one is actually a real thing. So Catwoman was... <laughs> <laughs> the one we just did was not a real thing. Yeah, this is not a real... I mean, it kind of was. So we got Michelle Pfeiffer, the original Catwoman in Classic. our minds. 92, um, yep. I was in love with her as She's, a young man. I mean, she looks amazing as Catwoman. Everybody remembers her. They remember how she looks more than how she acted. But she was still scary as shit. Yeah. That's what I remembered. So then next we have the probably the worst iteration, which is Halle Berry. Yeah, which I watched a scene from the other day um, as as uh, Byron Mann, who's in Skyscraper, who I interviewed last week, was in Catwoman. I was trying oh, to really? find a scene of him in Catwoman. Yeah. So I had to watch some YouTube clips. Uh, no success finding him in that film, but I did find her jumping around uh, with some very bad CGI. This movie, this movie, when I use the phrase unwatchable, is, it, it's yeah. correct. It's, it's unwatchable and appallingly bad. Appallingly bad. But I do have to say she does have the best outfit. I mean, that <laughs> outfit is banging. And then we're going to go to the third outfit, which do you, is... Do you think that if you were to change the, the, the mask, everything other than the mask, if you had made the mask, like, it's just, like, less embarrassing, it would have worked? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, because I kind of like the rest of it. Yeah, it's pretty hot, yeah. Uh, so then the third one we have is Miss Hathaway, or uh, what's her real name? Uh, in this film? Selena Kyle? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I think it's her name in all of them. It is, yeah. it is. Uh... I, do you have a favorite? I think it's the same as mine. What is it? Anne Hathaway. I love Anne Hathaway's Catwoman. And I think it's the glasses and the ears thing. Yeah. I don't know why I like that so much. Yeah. Uh, but I, I really loved what they did with Anne Hathaway. And they didn't try to make her too sexy. Now, don't get me wrong. She's stunning and she looks amazing in it. Yeah. But it wasn't overly sexualized. Yeah, I love, I love Anne Hathaway as Catwoman. I thought, like, she just kills it. Like, in that scene she in the beginning it. when she's the... Screaming. Uh, well, that scene's amazing. That's, that's my favorite. I was gonna say the one that I love is the beginning when she's in the when she's in the, uh, Wayne Manor oh. and she's got the things and she like yeah 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 <laughs> Mr. Wayne and then she kicks his legs out. Yeah. She jumps, and, like, out, the jumps out the window. She yeah. takes stuff off the arms and drives off. Yes, yeah, she's so awesome. Sick. That movie's good. Uh, all right, and then our very last one for who wore it best. We've got look Ben and I have both <laughs> we both gained weight and lost weight in our time and we know as you get older it is harder to stay in shape. So first we have to see who wore it best with the extra pounds. We got our good friend Mr. Kilmer. Yeah, Val Kilmer. Uh, I hope you pulled the picture. Oh, of course I did. <laughs> Dieter von Kahn <laughs> uh, from MacGruber. 
Uh, when, just, yeah, when Kilmer showed back up in this period of his career, in the 06 period, uh, as Chubby Kilmer, I, I was a big fan. I mean, he really, Deja Vu, wonderful. This movie, wonderful. Um, he vacillates a little bit, obviously. He, he, he gains and loses weight, but a uh, big fan of larger Kilmer. Oh, absolutely. He's amazing as Dieter von Kant. And then second, we have, I mean, <laughs> look oh, at Crow. Crow and the nice guys. He's as, barely fitting in the frame. Yeah, Fats Way Crow is what we refer to him <laughs> as here, because because in the movie, he, he is like very often sweaty. This is like a period of his very, career. He's always uncomfortable. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, <laughs> And I, I had a conversation with someone recently uh, t telling me stories that uh, there was, when he showed up to set, uh, that they weren't happy about the, the weight that he had gained, but they just had to move forward in production yeah. anyway. That he was even bigger when he showed up to set than he was in the auditions, yeah. which was already too big. Yeah, but little did they know, it makes the character that much better, in my opinion. The so, best. So my answer is that Crow wears it best here. I See, I have to split. This is our split decision. I have to go with Val Kilmer with because Dieter? I just love Von Kant so much. I remember him showing up in Dead and and being like, damn. But then in, in <laughs> MacGruber, I was like, wow. It works. He's owned it. Yeah, I, I do think it's funny how that how that can happen. Like, uh, weight on a character. Like, we've seen it happen with comedians a lot of the time where a, yeah. a, a bigger comedian will lose weight and they will sort of, like, lose some of their humor. Um, it's such a weird thing. Yeah, there's something about uh, uh, actors and actresses with gaining and losing weight. Like it can really change the way that they're able to like communicate their character. Like, they, yeah, like they're, the, uh, and the way uh, they're perceived emotionally. Like you don't react to them the same way sometimes when they're bigger or skinnier. It's weird. Yeah, it um, is weird. I but I react to Crow in a totally different way at a larger size than I did at like Maximus size. He is Maximus size here. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> uh, people seem to be agreeing with you that Crow <laughs> took that. So guys, that was our new segment. <laughs> Who wore it best? I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun for us. Yes, um, we're gonna continue moving through. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so I say let's uh, let's do a quick uh, box office and critical. Yeah, I'll just breeze through it. So Sony Columbia produced sixty-two million dollars to make this movie. It opened July twentieth, twenty eighteen. It grossed thirty-nine million domestic, and again only three million dollars worldwide, which is this crazy anomaly with Denzel movies worldwide and how they just don't do that well. I'm sure obviously that number will go up exponentially it because probably it's has only the first week. probably some territory. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But even then, it still just seems crazy low. Uh, for a grand total of $42 million its opening week, it was number one at $36 million. Now, this movie has a 7.2 on IMDb, which is, I believe, higher than its first film. But then its Rotten Tomato scores are a 51 by all critics, a 41 by top, and a 76 by mm. audience. Yep. Yeah, uh, I think I think those scores are pretty fair. Seven two feels a little high. This this feels like this. I really enjoyed this movie, but this feels like it's probably somewhere between the three Rotten Tomato scores to me. Like yeah. I would give this movie probably a little closer to like a like a sixty six or sixty seven. Yeah, I could see like a yeah like sixty eight to seventy for me probably. Yeah. Seems a little more, more, little more legitimate. Um, all right, so let's get into our next segment here, guys. This is going to be favorite line, your favorite line in the film, the thing that stuck with you the most. Pretty self-explanatory here. What do you yeah. got? Uh, mine. <laughs> so I always try really hard in new movies because yeah. you can't, you know, bust your phone out to remember. But yeah. the one that stuck with me the most, and there's a couple, but the one that stuck with me the most was, was two types of pain. Yeah, <laughs> pain that hurts. <laughs> And pain that alters. And I was like, oh, that sounds horrible. That sounds I, I want to know nothing about the second one. Yeah. And don't even do the first one to me. I used to think as a kid, if I got like captured as a POW and yeah. tortured, like I could I could hang it. Yeah. I could do it. Yeah. The other day, uh, I was fixing something and a bit of a staple went underneath my nail. Yeah. And I wanted to scream in pain <laughs> and agony, and it hurt for about 15 to 20 minutes. I would not do well mm. in any torture situation. Mm. Especially not yeah. one that alters. <laughs> Especially not one that alters. <laughs> so guys, don't uh, kidnap Andrew and try to torture him for my training regimen at Schmodown. Please don't. Yeah. Uh, my favorite line in this film has to be the one that they showed in the trailer. It's just like, because I guess I didn't see it in the trailer. Oh, so good. So it's yep. when he's when he's in the crack house and the guy's like, yo, who are you? And he's like, I'm your father. Your mother just forgot to tell you. I was like, <laughs> oh, was like, oh, oh. You fit so many words into that quick <laughs> sentence. Yeah, it was such a great rebuttal. Yeah, that's pre that was pretty excellent. I, I That one I also, and I also loved... Uh, uh, you can give me a five star rating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. not for me, for Amy. Yeah, or for her. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. Um, yeah, the other one. Uh, I'm killing each and every one of you. The only, the only disappointment is that I only get to do it once. Yeah, that's that was really a good, good. one. That was yeah. a good line. Um. Yeah, so uh, AMA question, I think we're going to have to skip today. Uh, we actually kind of talked about the one that I did want to talk about, which was like the Antoine Fuqua and the, the Tony Scott difference. Yeah. Um, really quickly, John, Josh Ryan did say, if there was any movie that Denzel could have made a sequel of in his career other than Equalizer, what would it have been? And for me, 
Uh, for me, it might have probably it probably would have been one of the uh, well, it couldn't have been Man on Fire because he because <clears throat> he obviously dies in that. I know movie. that's what, for me. I want to see the Man on Fire prequel. Yeah, that would have been great. I think I think that would have been really great. I also could see like any of the Tony Scott, any of like the great Tony Scott movies. I would have loved. I also think probably an Unstoppable sequel could have been pretty fun. Deja Vu too. Oh, Deja Vu. <laughs> deja Vu again. <laughs> uh, yeah. So those more are more Deja Vu. <laughs> a lot of Deja Vus. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is funny. Um, so, all right, guys, we are going to move past AMA question today. No Cage versus Cruise this week, but there are three action movie categories. Totally ridiculous, totally legitimate, and ridiculously legitimate. Uh, I don't think I really need to explain what those are anymore. We've done it so many times. What do you think? Uh, this movie's totally ridiculous. It has to be, right? Yeah, it's it's awesome. I and mean, we have there's so much we didn't get to talk about with this movie. Like we yeah. we like missed all the entire ending shootout. Like most of the action sequences. Yeah, the harpoon through the head is sweet. Yeah, the harpoon kill was great. Um, but like I think just like all of it, and like there's so many moments in this movie where there was moments that I loved, but there was also so many moments where I was like, Peter Pascal's like, I was your partner for seven years, Mac, and you're like. That's like a line from a Gruber. Like yeah, that, it is a line from a Gruber. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're like that's just there's so many things about this that are just just the action movie thing, and it's like this is just an action movie with an action movie script and action movie tropes, and yeah. everything about this is like silly. I liked the uh, when we were talking yesterday. It was like. What is the team doing going to this hometown on an island across a bridge in a hurricane? Just wait. Yeah, just wait. Just wait on the other side until he has to come across the bridge and kill him. Yeah, exactly. Or just don't go into a hurricane. Yeah. First of all, Rob Cohen directed that scene. (laughs) (laughs) I kept thinking about Rob throughout that scene. I was like, man, Rob would have brought so many win fans in. Oh my God. Hurricane heist. Love Rob Cohen. Huge fan. I have I off camera I have some stories to tell you about uh, entertainment studios that I heard over at Comic Con. Yeah. The the studio that paid all that money for that movie. I can't wait. That also like paid for Chappaquiddick and Forty Seven Meters Down and all these movies. Like just like I we're doing the Meg on this show. Yeah, totally. And I want to do that. That's their next movie. Is it? Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Good. This is amazing. Yeah. So uh, all right, guys. It sounds like we are in agreement. That totally ridiculous. We've just got one segment left on the show this week, and that's called (laughs) the pitch. Ooh, that so, was a little high. Yeah, little high. we've got an exciting one next week. Oh my Mission God. Impossible yeah. Fallout! Yeah. 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 That's oh, like climbing in MI2. so good. Yeah, I can't wait. You saw in the trailer that he's climbing. I've seen everything in the yeah. trailer so many times. I even saw the little thing about Henry Cavill, which I won't say in case yeah. you guys haven't seen it, but I saw that, yeah, and I'm dying. So we actually, not only do we are we doing this show next week and we're excited about it, but we have oh two God. very special guests. We have two awesome guests. Yeah, we've got the Real Rejects. John Humphrey and Greg Alba are coming on the show with us next week to break down Mission Impossible Fallout. So uh, tweet at those guys, Real Rejects. They have a huge YouTube following. Awesome dudes, also competitors in the Schmodown. So we will be having them on as first-time guests next week. We can't wait wait yeah uh, i'm a big fan of, of greg and john even though greg liked to throw a little jab at me in the free-for-all yeah. about being the team action guy uh but i'm so excited they're so excited they tweeted at us about our mi3 episode go and catch up with amas online go to our youtube page find mi3 4 5 1 and 2 we did them all we've done them all we've now. done every mission impossible film and we're gonna follow it up next week yeah with Mission Impossible Fallout. So, uh, Jules, thank you so much for being up in the booth today. Guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you want to follow along, you can find me at Ben Bateman Media, and you can find the podcast at Team Action Show. I love it. Uh, Guys, I'm Andrew Guy, and that's where you can find me online at that same name. All right, we'll see you guys soon. Bye. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal.